Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seeds of Liberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So today we have Brittany Schaefer, who is a voluntarist and an author. Uh, can I say illustrator as well? A little bit. I mean, the, the, the other artists did more than I did on this one, so I, I don't want to take too much credit for that. <laughs> so author of uh, the comic book, uh, uh, The Urban Yogini, A Superhero Who Can't Use Violence. Uh, and we'll discuss that. Uh, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, and also um, her article for LouRockwell.com that was that was published there. Uh, first, they came for the anti-vaxxers, um, which is uh, really a contentious uh, topic of uh, you know discussion for a lot of people. So of course we have to write about it and talk <laughs> about it naturally. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but Brittany, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I talked to you first in the uh, the Seeds of Liberty, and uh, you know we had a great conversation. And I'm like, all right, I want to get you on my show because uh, you know I'd love to uh, help you. Anybody who's who's um, you know using their um, their outlet, their specific platform for uh, spreading volunteerism and liberty, and, uh, and I try to do as much as possible to help them get more exposure. Yeah, so, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh, let me just mention your website real quick. Uh, uh, so, Brittany dot com is y y your personal, I guess, blog, right? And then you also have a uh, an account on Liberty dot me, uh, as well as uh, you know you can find uh, her on on Facebook at Brittany Schaefer and also on Twitter at Brittany. So, um, so yeah, so so please, uh, yeah, get into your. Um, your Urban Yogini um, uh, comic book and what it's about and uh, and uh, you know why you wrote it. Yeah, so this is this is Urban Yogini. If you can see her there. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I just I it just it hit me once. You know, we watch a lot of superhero stuff around here, and um, <laughs> yeah. and it struck me. I think watching a Batman, one of the which you know are brilliant. The 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 newer ones are brilliant, um, and it just struck me. There's so much, so much of the narrative is about, you know, superheroes combating these, you know, bizarre supervillains, you know, these individual supervillains or organized crime or something. When, when you look at the world and look at who the real criminals are, you know, the vast majority of them are part of the state. Mm. So wouldn't it be great to have a superhero who actually fought the state, who, or who fought, you know, agents of the state? Yeah. And so I just started thinking about that, started sketching out some ideas and some, some episodes and things. And I came up with, I actually came up with the first episode, um, I want to say like five years ago. I think, I think I actually wrote and illustrated that like five years ago. And then a couple years ago, uh, you know, wrote up the rest of this, which is like, it's like a 90 page, um, you know, book um and got some artists to help finish the rest of it because it would just would have taken me forever to do all the illustrations so um published at the end of last year and there are more there are more episodes in the pipeline um i don't i can't say when those will come out but um you know this is this is the start yeah i, I was thinking about it earlier today uh, I, was, I was telling one, one of my uh, homeschooling friends about it and uh saying you know the uh, superhero that can't use violence and and then i realized that you, it's funny you just mentioned batman because that's the exact one i said because batman well, his specific thing is he can't kill people right when he and that's his that's his specific um um what do you call it like uh his code, his, his code, yeah so right? yeah uh, and so he has to do everything he can to. I guess I guess he restricts people, restrains people, but he just doesn't kill people. Um, so so how would you say like for example, this is different than that? I mean I know like like Batman, you know he's extremely status, you know going along with the police and helping the police yeah. and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, this is different because um, she, so what happens is Urban Yogini and let me get a little picture of her. So what happens is she's she's this normal young woman um, living in the big city, and she gets into yoga. And starts her her pranic forces are unleashed, 
and she's taken over uh, by so so she witnesses um, police brutality. Uh, she and the first time it happens, she just feels helpless and upset, and there's nothing she can do. It happens a little later, and something else. You know, she starts sort of spinning out of control, and she's taken over by the force of urban yogini. <laughs> so what happens is this sort of this spiritual entity sort of takes her over um, when she sees injustice, but it's limited by the um, the yamas, the the yogic yamas, which are sort of restrictions. They're spiritual res practice restrictions, and one of them, I think, one of the fundamental ones is ahimsa which is the restriction of, of non-harming. You're not allowed to harm other beings. So it's not really the NAP. It's not really non-initiation of force. And in fact, she does use force. She actually, she kind of like back, Batman, she, in her first sort of episode, she picks the officers up and puts them up on a windowsill where they can't harm anybody. Mm -hmm. So she's able to move people around and do things, but she can't harm them. In fact, when she tries to, she can't do it. She can't make contact. She can't physically do the action. Um, and so that's her restraint. Um, and again, it's not, I, I kind of, part of it just sort of happened naturally because I started thinking of the yoga theme, but I also didn't really want to do sort of an NAP um, primer. I didn't want to turn this into a, a kind of, you know, superhero how-to for voluntarists. Um, it's more to bring up the issues of violence and harm and when that's justified, when it's not justified. And also, you know, what else can you do that's, that's what can you do that's not harmful um, if you're committed to justice, if you're committed to um, rectifying evil and that kind of thing. So it's really more to, to raise the issue and to get people questioning, you know, their support of violent institutions or their support of violence that they may not think of as violence. Um, you know, in one, in one part of the book, um, <clears throat> she's trying to sign a petition. The petition is to regulate some industry and she can't connect the pen to the paper because she can't figure it out. She can't, she doesn't know what she wants to sign it. She can't do it. And later on she figures out, Oh, you know, there's violence inherent in that. I can't, I'm not allowed to do that. Can you please um, extend that power to all politicians? <laughs> that would be... <laughs> if only, um, if only, and they wouldn't be politicians then. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That reminds me of uh, of uh, this meme. It's you know you see a politician and a pen and, a, and then a soldier, and it says more lives can be saved by taking away the pens from politicians <laughs> than taking away the guns from you know people. Yeah, uh, and yeah. and it's amazing. It's so true, and it's so sad because you know if you think about it politicians or you I mean any kind of dictator or tyrant in history they don't actually kill people you know they 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 right. give the orders except and, in game of thrones yeah well yeah i guess but still i mean the amount of people that yeah. an, that an individual tyrant can kill is like minuscule compared to you know when you give an order to hundreds of thousands of order fo order followers and then you know genocide happens right so right. so right. it's really amazing how you know we we give these people so much attention and, you know, that's how they get their power, yet they really don't do much. It's, it's really the people who yes. obey their insane, exactly. maniacal, or you know, whims. Yeah, I mean, I think the more I think about it and the more I see what's going on, I just feel like the, the, the most dangerous vice, the most damaging thing we've got going on as human beings is our propensity for obedience and to just trust authority and, you know, respect authority that's that's the worst part of our nature and it's just it's everywhere um you know even in you know we consider ourselves to be an advanced sort of intellectual civilization but look at how we behave look at how people just blindly follow um you know their leaders anybody in authority how they how they listen to those in authority without really questioning what they're saying i mean it's just it's deadly yeah, yeah, and uh, as, and so going back to to Batman, I was thinking about because I saw this one podcast uh, this guy did, and and the question was, is Batman a statist? Hmm. Uh, you know, because because you know, yeah, he doesn't use violence, and you know, he c protects the innocent, and you know, so it seems like he's a good guy, right? But uh, but then you think about it, he's um, he's helping to enforce laws, 
and he's helping the police, the law enforcement class, <laughs> you know. Right. And, but does he ever does he ever help to enforce victimless crime laws? Like, is he is he only going after ah, right. murderers yeah, exactly. and the psycho killers? I'm just I'm trying to think of examples where cause I know I've, I know I've been pissed off at him for certain things <laughs> I know what they were. Um, because I think of him as mostly going after the real criminals. The I mean, real of, yeah, with the crime, with the crime, yeah, the victims. Yeah, yeah, but is that true? You know, does it is you know? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I guess he 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 treads in the middle a little bit, but um, but yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, they, this, I think that begs the question. You know, is there a good cop, right? And, and, right. And uh, and what is a good cop? And and um, you know, because if you you know choose to become a, a law enforcement officer, you you have um you have decided to enforce all of the laws, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and even if, and, and, so yeah, so in a sense, you have to be a robot to just enforce all of the laws. But then if you ask an law enforcement officer that, or you talk to somebody who wants to be law enforcement, they say, no, they have discretion. So, and then, <laughs> and then I say, so are you saying that according to your mood that day, you can choose to enforce whichever, like thousands of laws, you know, you deem fit according to if you wow. had your coffee or not that morning? Wow. Get right? Yeah, but I mean, he's probably right. They, pr I mean, they do, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think once you sign up for that game, I, I, I do believe some people go into that with good intentions, mm. but it's kind of like signing up, you know, signing up to be an SS officer. You know, you're, you're signing up for something that's fundamentally evil, or a big chunk of it is. And, it's a dilemma because what if you really, you know, what if in your heart you really do want to, you know, fight real crime, you know, protect people against murder and, and assault and kidnapping and all that kind of thing. You know, what in this world, what else can you do? You, there's not really, because there aren't, there aren't I mean, my, I, I talked in my article about um, the Detroit Threat Management Group, which is a private alternative. But right now, you know, there's so little of that. It's like if, if that's what you want to do with your life. The, the big opportunity for that is to sign up with this fundamentally immoral organization. So it's tough for someone who does want to be, you know, a good, a good person protecting people from crime. It's a tough choice. And yet, you know, I don't think, I don't think signing up for an organization that imprisons people for nonviolent and for victimless crimes, I don't think that's a satisfactory answer. I don't think that absolves you of, of guilt. Yeah, I was just I was just talking about this um, today uh, with with, with, uh, with the same friend about victimless crimes because my mother just got a ticket, um, <laughs> and uh, you know going seventy eight and a fifty five, and uh, it was like a two hundred and thirty dollar ticket. Lock her up. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so you know my mother's a uh, she's a Democratic Socialist, born Bernie Sanders <laughs> supporter, and you know we get into some interesting heated arguments. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but but of course you know. You know, when I once I point out the idea of victimless crimes, you know, she defends it, saying, "Well, you know, we need these laws because, because if people are driving crazy, you know, other people can get hurt and and all those kinds of stuff." And and I'm like, "Well, you know, you know, the idea for, for the first idea of is there a victim, right? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, like, if you know, if a police officer is doing something that that if a regular person did it is immoral." How can that be justified? Right? right. If you can't pull somebody over, or or let's say let's say let's say you see somebody with a broken tail light, right? And you as a regular person say, you know what? This person needs to fix their tail light. So you you tailgate them, you harass them, you you shout right. at them, say pull, pull over. And if they don't pull yeah. over, what are you gonna do? Drive them off the road and kill them or tase them or <laughs> like? Do you feel right. justified? Right. In doing that? <laughs> right. Know? Well, and that's why that's why the Detroit threat management um, example was so so sort of instructive because what um, Dale, the guy who runs it was saying is that, you know, everything, because they're a civilian organization, because they're private people, they're not, they're not entrusted with this, these special powers you get oh, from yeah. the badge, yeah. you know, they're not allowed to do any of that stuff. So they have to be really careful. Everything they have to do, everything they do has to be in accordance with the law. They can't go around harassing people. Mm -hmm. They can't mm -hmm. prosecute vic victimless crimes. They can't do anything even against a real criminal that, is illegal. They have to be very careful with what they do. And what's interesting is they've been very successful and they haven't had any, any of their people, um, die in action. So, um, 
you know, they're doing, they're doing something right. And I think that something is accountability. I think that something is that, you know, when you, when, when the law applies to everyone and you don't get any special privileges because you're, you know, entrusted with enforcing it, things just work better. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited. I'm, I'm actually, I, I set a date to interview the guy, Dale Brown. Oh, uh, awesome. I'm so excited. Awesome. Um, yeah. He's, Cause I've heard him, he was interviewed by, I think Tom Woods Tom and, Woods and, did uh, a great and with him. Uh, Jeff Berwick also an Intercast. Great. Yeah, so the guy is really getting around and I'm really happy That's to see awesome. him. So yeah. I've, I'm plan you know, in my crazy schedule, I'm planning to do a follow-up article sort of looking into, into his claims and, you know, sort of digging into, you know, well, did crime really do go down that much in these neighborhoods and just getting some details on that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. There's just, there's so much in that. There's so much. It's such a huge story. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad that's getting around. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the idea of, uh, you know, cell 411, right? The app. Right. So, yeah. So combining yeah. him and cell 411 and, you know, what can that, what can that achieve? And actually, do, do you remember, I think it was in um, Jeff Berwick's interview when he was saying actually that he he doesn't like the idea of cell four one one because he's, oh, yeah. because he says that um, you know if you're having a heart attack or or something's happening to you that a trained professional um, would understand but you're just their friend and so you you know a friend is trying to help but in in trying to help you don't really know what to do you might be unintentionally hurting right the person you know which is kind of true but at the yeah. same at the same time your you, your dog's not gonna die and. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it also kind of depends where you live. I mean, in my neighborhood, um, we've had to call nine one one a couple times for medical things, and I don't worry about it. We live in a we live in a nice neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cops don't go around shooting dogs and mm -hmm. and stuff. And where where we are, we're we're lucky. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. I would. I, I'd still be very hesitant to call the police, but I don't mind calling paramedics. Mm -hmm. In another neighborhood, it might be you might be better off with your untrained friend than a trained professional who's you know scared of you and looking for any excuse to shoot. I don't. I don't know. I mean, there are just there are some situations where it's not such an obvious trade off. It's good to have the option. It's good to have choices. Yeah, like right now the only choice is nine one one, and you know, yeah. I guess there's, no, there's, no, there's yeah, there's no competition, <laughs> really, and that's what we that's what we definitely need is yeah. competition. Yeah, well, um, we need Uber for nine one one. Say again. We need Uber for nine one one. Right? Yeah, like uh, like like I'm an acupuncturist, right? And I heard that um, um, one of us, somebody told me that there's this. Oh, it's for massage therapy. Right? I also do massage therapy, and they said there's this app where where it's, I kind of like Uber. But for massage therapists. Oh, interesting. So you can you can you can uh, re request a massage therapist through through this app, and they oh, would come to your house. And <laughs> well, you know, there's also something, and I think it's only in was it Philadelphia or I don't think it was New York City. There's I think it might only be in Philadelphia, but it's an Uber-like thing for medical professionals, you know, in their off hours, and you can you can request some kind of, you know, obviously not open heart surgery or something like that, right. but, you know, minor stuff, outpatient stuff, stuff you might go into an office for, mm -hmm. um, and they'll come to your house. They'll, um, you know, I think even minor emergencies, I have to, I have to don't quote me on that, but, mm -hmm. but like minor medical stuff, these people in their off hours, you know, sign up to be on call and they'll go, you know, for a fee and, you know, check out your sprained wrist or, you know, set something or, you know, just check you out, make sure you're, you know, whatever, whatever the thing is, you know, saving you a trip into the doctor, um, you know, just the Uberizing healthcare in a very small way. Yeah. I, I do remember something. I oh, forgot the name of the, do you remember the name of the, the organization that does that? Don't, you know what? I'm going to, I'm just going to do a quick look because I've got it. I may not be able to find it, but I'm just going to look in one yeah, place. Yeah, because I, I do remember, um, I think it was Tom Woods. Yeah, that's right. It's Tom Woods. He interviewed a guy who had a, a, a company like that of um, medical services like that uh, is very cheap primarily because it's like direct to the patient. You know, they have Oh, yeah, yeah, that's another thing. So that's, yeah, that's cash-only doctors who they're just opting out of the insurance um, paradigm yeah. and it's cash-only yeah, I've got a bunch of articles on that. Um, I mean, and I've experienced that myself with a lot of our doctors. Some of our best doctors have been not necessarily cash only, but um, 
you know, independent practitioners and more and more just refusing to deal with insurance, partly because it costs them so much. I mean, they have to hire a whole person just to handle the insurance BS. Yeah. And then we had one doctor tell us um, when Obamacare was about to pass, she sent out a, a note to all of her patients saying, you know, when this happens, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to not only stop taking insurance, I need to stop putting insurance codes on my invoices because um, and I'm taking her word for this. I haven't looked into it myself to see if this is how it works. But apparently, um, the the board, not the licensing boards, but the boards, the the, the medical boards that oversee um, standards of care mm -hmm. and um, that th that are basically looking at at her to make sure she's in compliance. Um, that board applies if you're. If you're going, if your stuff is going through insurance at all, so in other words, even if you don't submit it, but if your patient submits it to insurance, you then fall under that board's um, scrutiny, uh -oh. and yeah. it's all. I mean, as you know, I'm sure it's it's all sort of um, this this one size fits all standard. So anybody who's practicing anything alternative can easily you know, run afoul of their, of their recommendations and can get in trouble for it. And she just said, you know what, it's just not worth it. It's not worth the risk mm -hmm. to maybe, you know, run afoul of these guys. Um, so, so that's entirely cash only. Not only can we not, not only will she not, you know, submit it to insurance, we, I can't even submit it to insurance anymore. So I'm seeing more and more of that just in our, in our lives, unless, you know, unless it's like at a big hospital or something, mm -hmm. um, more and more, and it's usually the better ones. It's the older ones, the ones who've been around for a long time, and you know have have an expectation of how much independence they should have. Um, you know, it's it's sad. It's like it's like the good independent practitioners are. It's just getting harder and harder for them to practice, and it's like they're just they're being pushed out. And the new generation, I don't know what that's going to be like. I mean, younger doctors to me seem a lot more kind of indoctrinated and a lot less independent thinking. Um, okay. So let me just see if low cost healthcare. Huh. Um, yeah, that's, I don't, that's, I'm going to look, I'm going to look this up and see if I can, cause I do have it here somewhere. It's not yeah, worth yeah, send it. To me, yeah. Send it to me later and I'll put it in the, uh, in the show. Yeah. Notes. It's really cool. Uh, really cool resource. Um, but, you know, I think it's a natural um, it's a natural effect of this bloated bureaucracy that's been developing, you know, in healthcare. that uh, eventually, you know, people are going to just opt out because, you know, it's like, I don't want to take part in that. I don't want to, you know, like you said, have to hire all these people just to process and, and, and you know, write all the paperwork and like, I don't want to do that. And so I think it's just a natural uh, the natural next step is for people to just say, no, I don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. and in fact, getting back to urban Yogini, yeah. um, in one of the next episodes down the pipeline, one of the things that happens is, um, she runs into, there's a, there's a group that's like underground practitioners, the underground doctors, and it's become so bureaucratized and so regulated and so threatening mm. to anything alternative that these folks have just gone underground and they're practicing, you know, um, totally in secret and, um, you've got to have like a secret handshake to get into their, you know, <laughs> underground offices down in the sewer system. And, um, so yeah, so that's, that's something I play with too. Yeah. And I just heard a recent, uh, Tom Woods interview, uh, where he talked to this guy, I forget his name. He, he wrote, he's an, he's an MD and he wrote an article about how, uh, how medical licensing has hindered um, you know, not only hindered medical progress, but has made everything much more expensive oh, and, yeah. and inaccessible yeah. to the regular person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, and people don't realize that like, like everybody, a lot of people tend to yeah. think that, you know, we need licensing, we need standardization, you know, we got to have a basic educational, um, you know, paradigm to, so people can learn and get the basics. But it's so crazy. And when you look at the history of that, how that developed, um, you know, like the, the Flexner report, when that came out, it was all political. It was all because the people, it was, it was basically the people making drugs, people starting to make drugs wanted to take over the system. They wanted, they, they didn't like the competition and they wanted, they wanted to be able to set standards and exclude anybody who didn't do things their way. And I mean, it was totally political. There was no science behind it. I mean, science at that point was so, you know, medical science 
back then was so ridiculous anyway. Um, yeah, the whole thing was political. There's no justification for it. And, um, and, and there are so many examples of, you know, within specialties in medicine, um, there are so many examples of private, um, not licensing, but accreditation boards where, you know, obviously people care about the, their standards of care and you can do that privately. You can, you can get certification from a private entity that says, yeah, these, this person knows what they're doing. This person did this and this and this and went to school for this long and all that stuff, as opposed to having, you know, a government sponsored entity that has the power to keep you out of business if you don't, mm -hmm. you know, do, do things the way they want them done and pass their certification. Um, and it also limits the number of people out there. I mean, um, as well as the, you know, the number of people who can operate a certain machine, you know, something anybody could be trained to operate, you know, in the period of a week, but no, you have to have gone to school for four years and, um, and, you know, and that adds to the cost. I mean, if you add up all of the different crazy interventions in the medical world, you know, the costs are, no wonder it's so crazy expensive. Yeah, definitely. So, so going along this, um, this medical topic, can you get into your, uh, article first they came for the anti-vaxxers uh, yeah, and why yeah. you wrote that and, and what's about yeah so i wrote this um uh, a year ago um just over a year ago um yeah so we um i've always been skeptical of vaccines and um we did not vaccinate our kids um, I looked at every, every individual one and, you know, there were some I considered and it just never seemed worth it. Um, part of, part of the issue for me was it's so hard to get really accurate information about, um, vaccine injury. It's really not reported well. And, um, by all accounts, it's very, very underreported. So, um, so I always sort of weighed things on the side of, on the side of being very, very, um, safety conscious and, and skeptical of that. Um, so, but I, but I had never written anything about it, um, until there started to be just this frenzy of, um, people calling for mandated vaccines and, you know, parents who don't vaccinate to be thrown in prison. And, you know, this idea that we're somehow putting, everybody else at risk, um, putting other people's kids at risk. Um, that whole sort of, the whole conversation has really been taken over by the, the sort of pro vaccine fanatics. Um, meaning the people who benefit from, from selling vaccines, of course. Um, so I just, I wrote this article. Um, it's pretty long. It's, it's in depth. It goes, it goes into, or rather it's, it's in depth, but trying, you know, covering as much ground as I can. So I talk about, um, just sort of the dishonesty of how this issue is presented in the media um, from the fact that most of the articles, I mean, it's almost as if, I'm not saying this is what's happened, but it's almost as if the pharmaceutical companies have sent out um, press releases to all of the, and, you know, and contact sheets of which, you know, three people to talk to um, for this issue. And every single media outlet has just bought it up. And I mean, you can read article after article where, they only talk to people on the pro vaccination side. They only interview, you know, Dr. Offit and, you know, half the time don't mention that he makes money from the vaccine he created. I mean, it's, it's just dishonest, you know, I don't even want to say journalistic standards because it's not even journalism. It's just PR. Um, so I talk about that. I talk about some of the, you know, some of the standard myths, um, the, the whole, um, the measles frenzy is this, you know, all of a sudden measles is this, is this thing to be terrified of. Well, in fact, you know, long before um, the measles vaccine came into existence, measles mortality had declined to the point where, I mean, people considered it a, a mild childhood disease. And in fact, there are benefits from having gone through it. I mean, is there are benefits from having gone through many diseases, that doesn't mean they're all worth, you know, you have to obviously weigh the risks against the benefits, but measles, by the time the vaccine came along, the risks were, were pretty small. And now it's being played up as this, you know, Ebola. I mean, um, and then, you know, I also talk about how, you know, in, in the midst of this, so um, I open up by talking about how my, my daughter and I had just been at UCLA. And as it happened, 
the few days we were there coincided with this outbreak they had of an antibiotic resistant bacteria and it killed, I think two people while we were there in the same building we were in. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and in fact, um, drug resistant, um, superbugs kill about 15,000 people a year. Um, and yet there's not this crazed outcry. There's not this, oh my God, people who overuse antibiotics should be imprisoned and quarantined. And, you know, it's just this, this crazy kind of selective, what are we going to be afraid of? Let's, you know, what's, what's the media going to tell us to be afraid of this week? And, oh, it's measles. Okay. We'll be afraid of measles next week. It'll be chicken pox. I mean, people just, people aren't thinking about this. I think people are just accepting blindly, um, what's, what's been pumped into the media. And so that was, that was what my article was addressing. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, yeah, I have two kids, a five-year-old and a three-year-old, you know, they're both not vaccinated at all. Um, and, and yeah, so they're I, I, sick all the time, right? Oh my God. They're deathly ill. <laughs> I mean, they're very strong kids, really strong. And, uh, you know, the way I look at it, you know, my, my, the reasons for not vaccinating for me have changed. They've evolved over the past few years. Like in the beginning, I was real focusing on like, um, you know, reading about the specific vaccines and the side effects and the, you know, the autism right. and all that. And, and, you know, going into the studies and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that the, you know, the individual ingredients, you know, have not been tested in, you know, with kids. And so if the right. individual ingredients have not been tested, what about combining these? And then what about giving multiple to an infant that has like an immature immune system, immature, um, you know, brain development, yeah, yeah, everything, neural, de yeah, neural yeah. development, yeah. everything. And, uh, and what are the effects on that in development? It's just crazy. Um, and, um, and then now, uh, as, as I'm getting more into volunteerism and, and free market capitalism and all that and anarchy, um, now I'm, I look at, I mean, I also still think about that, but I also think it's also about consent and it's also about medical choice. Right. right. And, and, right. The, and the simple idea of good ideas don't require force. Right. right. So that's if, a bigger issue. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You know, if you don't have a choice in the matter, um, and people say this is for your own good, you immediately should question it immediately. Right. Well, and that's what's so scary about it. And not so much that they're saying it's for your own good, but that you're putting others at risk by not right. being vaccinated. Yeah. And the whole idea is that, you know, somehow, you know, we've gone, you know, we've gone thousands of years without having this expectation that everybody around you is germ free. <laughs> and now suddenly there's this expectation. I can enforce an expectation on everybody around me, everyone in public, that they don't have any germs or that they don't have any, you know, anything that could contaminate me. And that's absurd. I mean, that's kind of, it's equating, um, you know, it's equating not, and it's not even not having the germs. It's using our specific method to, you know, to prevent, um, to prevent infection. Um, equating that with, you know, being infected with some highly contagious disease, which, you know, there, there, there is a point where, you know, having an infectious disease and going out in public, I think could legitimately be considered assault. If you have Ebola and you know it mm. and you go out and you start coughing on people, yeah, that's, that's a violation. But there's so much ground in between that and not using our particular method for protecting yourself against all these other diseases. There's so much territory in between that. And yet people are equating the two. I mean, it's, it's kind of scary. It's kind of the, the, the lack of thinking going on there and the misinformation. I mean, there was this whole, there was this ad campaign. I don't know if you saw it last year, I think it was, um, where there's the big bad wolf. Um, granny turns into the big bad wolf because granny's not vaccinated against pertussis <laughs> and the parents bring their little baby to visit granny and she's got a little cough so she doesn't know she's got whooping cough and she coughs on the baby and gives it whooping cough and, and horrible granny. Well, what's crazy, and this was put out by the manufacturers, I think it's GlaxoSmithKline, it put out by the manufacturers of the vaccine who should know better because the crazy thing is you can be vaccinated against pertussis. People who are vaccinated against it, even if it protects them against pertussis, they can still be carriers. They can still carry it and transmit it to other people. In fact, they're more likely to because they're going to have less lesser symptoms. They're going to be less symptomatic. They're less likely to be home sick, mm -hmm. taking care of themselves, more likely to be out in public passing this on to other people. So the idea that getting vaccinated against pertussis is somehow protecting 
the people around you is completely backwards. <laughs> and I know the people who make the vaccine know that. So, you know, this isn't just bad information, it's misinformation and, um, and people are buying it up. Is that, is that the idea of shedding the virus? Like, no, that's, that's, not, that's not even shedding. So there are vaccines that shed. So there are live vaccines that shed. Some of the vaccines are live and they can shed. Mm. This isn't even shedding. Okay. This is just, let's say you're vaccinated against whooping cough. And let's say it protects, what, what that does is it protects you to some degree against the symptoms of whooping cough. It doesn't prevent you from being a Petri dish for the whooping cough bacteria and for passing that on to other people. Mm. That can still happen. Hmm. So it's, yeah, it's not shedding. Shedding is, is a little bit different, oh. but, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Going back to what you said about, um, you know, aggression being, you know, having an uh, infectious disease and go out in public, it's kind of like, um, I guess a person having an STD and knowing they have an STD and then, and then, um, intentionally having unprotected sex with people without telling right. them, right? right. And, and that's kind of a, an, an interesting, right. yeah, method of aggression, I guess. But, and um, yet most people would agree that if you're out having sex with different people, it's a little bit incumbent on you to protect yourself. You don't, you, you don't get to, you know, if, if somebody else gives you something and they, let's say they didn't know they had it, you don't then get to blame them. The, the, you don't get to say, oh, well, it's entirely your fault because you do bear some responsibility for protecting yourself. And yet yeah, yeah, with the yeah, whole yeah. vaccine debate, it's, that seems to disappear. It's, it's not only am I responsible for protecting myself, but you're responsible for protecting yourself mm -hmm. and in the way that I say you have to, not in a way you choose. And regardless of the risks, you know, I'm going to sit here and deny that there are any risks to my method, but, you know, regardless of those risks, you, I can demand that you take those risks on really hard. It's very difficult because there is so much, there's so much corruption by these, these special interests. And a lot of that has to, has to do with government involvement as well. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's all, it, it's all, um, between the, med the medical schools and the journals and the way this stuff is taught and the fact that there are, there are bodies of people who get to decide whether you can practice or not. There are bodies of people that get to decide um, what gets taught in the schools. Um, that's just a bad mix. That's a bad mix for the truth and it's a bad mix for science. I mean, I don't see how science can happen in an environment like that where there's, you know, where you have a, a, a body of people who have the, the political power to stop you from practicing or to stop you from teaching if you don't toe the line. Yeah, yeah, like, um, you know, the pharmaceuticals, they, um, you know, they pay for the ads in the journals, in the medical journals, yeah. they, 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 yeah. they, they, like, donate to do the, or they, they control through their, through their, um, through the money that the, the the universities that that train the doctors, they they bribe the politicians, they <laughs> they yeah. write their own yeah. regulations, they they they, yeah. they pay for the 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 research that that um, that goes into their own pharmaceuticals and their own vaccines, and <laughs> they control the results. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's it's hard to it doesn't mean you don't look at the evidence, but it's very hard to untangle what's what's good and what's not. Oh yeah. It's so much. It's so much like 1984, where like you know, yeah. history is being erased and altered and manipulated yeah. and changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it so, is. and so that's yeah, that's that's. Um, I, I've really simplified my position on the vaccine. You know, I think I think you know, yeah. you, you can talk to people and say that you know, the, is this side effect these people damaged and you know, what about the vaccine court? You never heard about. You can't sue the doctors, and that's true. But it mm -hmm. all comes down to choice, medical it choice. Does. You know, it does. you and, know, you own other people. Yeah, if I don't have the choice to do with my own body or with my own kids, um, then who does? And if the state does, then what does that say? That the state owns my child? <laughs> right, right. I mean, if you don't, if you don't have that choice, then what choice do you have? What what freedom do you have left? If they can decide what chemicals get to go inside your body, inside your children's bodies, then what what freedom exactly do you have left? Yeah, and and another another thing that I got into before I uh, I studied acupuncture was um, alternative cancer therapies. And oh yeah, that's I, was, I was learning about you know the Gerson therapy and Essiac therapy, and then there's like one using baking soda treating cancer as a fungus. Um, yeah, there's so many different ones. Um, Royal Rife, you know, there, there's another one, and and what's interesting about all of them is. Um, how they ended <laughs> i mean i mean actually the gerson therapy is still around but but a lot of them you know 
you know, it's, it's like the common thing of like their laboratories were destroyed in a strange fire. All the files were destroyed, uh, you know, and, wow. and the person uh, died under mysterious circumstances as well. And yeah, uh, a few of those lately, too. Oh, yeah, the vaccine. Yeah, right. The doctors that died from the vaccine. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's and it's really um, it's really pretty interesting. And the Gerson, th I don't know if you know much about the Gerson therapy. Do I don't. Know? I've I've heard the term. I don't I don't know much about it. Oh, I've, I have read a good deal about it and it, some great documentaries. Uh, it was um, um, it was made by this guy, Max Gerson, in the 1930s and 40s from from Germany. And uh, and basically, I think he cured. It's, it's basically the Gerson therapy is basically like raw um fruit and vegetable juices and also uh coffee enemas you know detoxing so he combines you know really powerful juicing as well as um as as detoxing through through coffee enemas and then other other various supplements too um and uh and and so of course they, they cannot practice in the united states <laughs> yeah yeah because because if you say you know nobody can say they, they treat cancer except an oncologist right you know the right. only legal right. ways to treat cancer right. are surgery radiation and chemo right and so right. if you say anything else like like and as an acupuncturist or an herbalist i can say that i i treat the side effects of of chemotherapy but i can't say right. I treat cancer. You can't, right. right and and so or you get in a little cell with bars on it yeah. <laughs> right. So so um so yeah, so so the people, the practitioners who do this, they have to leave the country. And so you have you have uh you know, the um the clinic is in Mexico and then there's one in Hungary. Um and and but it's really fascinating because the people who go to these um to these clinics are basically the people that have been turned away from their oncologist and basically says, you know, we have done everything, there's nothing more to do, oh, wow. I can't help you. You're get, a hopeless case. Get your affairs in order. You know, that's it. Prepare to die. And so, and a lot of them say, no, I, I don't accept that. And so they, they go online, they find out the Gerson therapy and they, and they try. And so these people, they get the worst, the absolute worst cases, the terminal cases that nobody else wants to treat. And they have like an 80, 80, 85% success rate of, wow. of turning these things around. It's really a fascinating thing. Um, and, uh, and, and it's just so tragic how, you know, you can see, you know, that's just one aspect of, of how uh, a government agency suppresses competition, you know, the FDA. Yeah. And, and it's yeah and, and so yeah. That, that that's what i that's what that's what i was interested that's what i was studying a lot because i as i got into acupuncture and eastern nutrition and and herbal medicine and so yeah that was my in to this kind of stuff you know was learning about oh, the fda and, yeah and, yeah the fda is absolutely evil let's just don't even get me started on that <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. And that's just that's just one. And you know, n not to mention the fact, you know, talking about the FDA, like, like you know, the war on drugs, for example. Like, like how how many how many people die from like you know marijuana, um, maybe cocaine, heroin, also as compared to prescription medication, properly right. properly prescribed and properly right. used, right. <laughs> not right. abused. And yeah. What is it? Med um. Iatrogenic death is now is the second largest or third largest cause right. of death. Yeah, <laughs> next to like it's heart like disease death. and cancer or something. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Isn't that yeah. amazing? And, and how many people have died because they didn't have access to medical marijuana? Yeah. For example, as an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so so it's really tragic. So, um, but but let, let me let me tell you a real quick story that happened to me and my kids regarding yeah. vaccines. Um, so my daughter goes to a um. Uh, you know, we signed her up for, for gymnastics, her and my son, and uh, we were going to this one place for two for a few weeks. And then uh, this one time I was there and I was sitting in the waiting room with these two other mothers. <clears throat> and you know how, you know, when you're talking to mothers and, and, and they say, you know, natural questions are, how old is your child? Oh, my child's five. Okay, so he's in first grade. And I say, no, he's homeschooling. Ah, he's homeschooled. So we got this interesting conversation about that. Oh, by the way, these both these parents are public school teachers. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> so that was a good, it was a good conversation. Uh, I kept it civil, you know. I, uh, okay. I, I I'm, I'm pretty good at that, at keeping, you yeah. know, very contentious topics uh, to be calm and peaceful and I try to be non-confrontational and everything and I think they were getting emotional <laughs> but I try to, try to calm things down uh, talk slowly you know no, don't raise yeah. your voice and everything and and then got into vaccines right and oh, I, I forget how but one of the women asked me um, do you vaccinate and I said no and so <laughs> and so the, the other woman said oh I guess it's, it's fine because you know because we're all vaccinated so we're all protected and the other one's like no it's not fine because your kids are putting our kids at danger, and then and then again, it, it it sounds like a you know intimidating, threatening conversation. I I kind of explained myself very calmly and gently, and 
and and I thought I ended it well, um, and I got her her uh, her name. We shook hands afterwards, and she left. And then later, before the next week of uh, of uh, of the gymnastics class, the owners called me and said, "I want to talk oh to my you." God, <laughs> no way! And so and so she said basically that. Um, those two women, actually, all the women in the class, they're all friends, and all their all okay. their kids go to daycare. I guess the first grade is in the same place, and they're all vaccinated, of course. And so they said that um, if he continues to go with his kids, we're not going to go. We're all not going to go. We're all not going to go. And so, and so, and so, basically, um, you know, the 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 the, uh, the owner, what she was saying, you know, you put me in a very difficult situation as a business owner. I can't afford to lose all that business. And so she's like, I can, see, she, I see. can she afford a lawsuit for for discrimination? Okay, okay, so that okay, <laughs> let, let, let me, that, let, but okay. you wouldn't do that. Okay, but. hold on, let me get to that. So, so, um, yeah. So I asked her, you know, can I do another class? Like she has different classes in the week, and she's like, no, because what if one of the other women recognizes you and says? That's oh, the guy. Wow. Oh my god! <laughs> so, I mean, I was just laughing. I mean, like, wow, I couldn't believe this. And I did mention, like, is this could this considered be like profiling or, <laughs> you know, bigotry? But I'm, I'm like, yeah, all right. I mean, I understand yeah. as a, as a business owner, you know, you make these kind of hard decisions, and you know, you know, you know, she was clearly, she was telling me very clearly, like, I don't really care what you do in your private life, but this is mainly a business decision. I don't have a, I don't have any opinion in this matter, you know, things like that, which is very right. business. Right. Right. right, I get it, but at the same time, I mean, if you had wanted to be a jerk about it, you could have sued. You could okay, have sued so then right? that, then of course, uh, my wife said that, like, well, we should sue them. I should getting angry and everything. And I'm like, well, I mean, first of all, as, as a as a volunteer, as an anarchist, and then <laughs> using the say, and then second of all, the other thing is, um, as a business, I I respect uh, the right the, the right the, to... the, the right to dissociate, right? So 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 we yeah. are. I, I don't feel you know. I don't feel like um, any business. Um, how do you say? Uh, I don't feel like I deserve the. Um, you know, the service of anybody like, like, right. you know, and so for somebody to turn me away for whatever reason, right. I mean, it could That's be, right. you know, so it's, it's just a freedom of dissociation and although it can be very painful uh, and, you know, when it's due to ignorance, you know, it's like, it's like when, you know, when businesses turn away, you know, like gay people or black people or any kind of Muslim right. people, you know, you, you, you know, it just like, just like as individuals, we have the freedom to, to associate with whomever we want, right? Same thing when you have a business. You have the freedom to yeah. associate and do business with whoever you want and not do business with whoever you want. So, so yeah, yeah. it was kind of difficult for my wife to, <laughs> but, but yeah. Wow, what a story though. That's, um, and I'm, I, on some of the groups that I'm not, again, I'm not on Facebook that much anymore, but um, I've been on a few parents groups and I've heard similar stories to that where um, people have just have run into things at their schools or, um, you know, in places like that where they've just run into some, you know, irate parents who find out. I mean, most people I know just they don't talk about it. They just they don't say whether they vaccinate or not. And it's it's kind of scary because it's this ignorance that's fueled, um, deliberately fueled. I mean, I think it's been created by the people who want to push vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, but it's this ignorance and people just they just eat it up. And I understand it because I understand, you know, you can't nobody has the time to look deeply into every issue that's out there. There's just, yeah. there's there are too many issues. There's too much information. No one has the time for that. But the fact that people just soak it up, don't question it. Don't say, well, you know what? I haven't really, all I've heard is what CBS news told me. And, you know, I know they are, you know, corporate media and hacks and I'm not going to take their word for everything. Mm -hmm. There's just, there's not a healthy skepticism. There's just this like mob mentality, you know, grab the pitchforks and, yeah. um, and start, you know, running towards the end. It's just, it's a, it's a little frightening because I don't think it would take much. I really don't think it would take much, um, to push people just a little bit more and have things get really ugly. Um, yeah. it's just, and it's that same ignorant mob mentality. You know, it's the same thing that, you know, was once used against, against, um, you know, people of other ethnicities mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, historically has just had been used in really ugly ways. And it's like, we haven't learned anything. We haven't learned, um, not to behave that way. Yeah. There's, um, there's another way that I, I, I kind of, uh, learned about recently of how to look at the news, you know, the mainstream news. Um, and so if, if you are skilled and in a particular field, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, 
I don't know, writing or I like say I'm skilled in acupuncture and I and I look at the mainstream news and I see a segment they do on acupuncture, I can immediately point out all of the uh, imperfection and, and, and inconsistencies that they, they make, right? All the errors that they say uh, because they're, they're not experts in acupuncture, right? And so I understand that, right? And so I don't take their word for that. But for some strange reason, if I look at anything or like I say the common person looks at everything else that's not their specialty, they're like, that must be right. <laughs> right, right, right. Which is crazy. I mean, even even if you're looking at things that aren't your specialty, you should at least have sort of the the knowledge and just having been around long enough to know that everything out there is put out by somebody with an agenda. Right. And that doesn't mean it's all false, but you you can't just you can't just take things at face value. I mean, that's that just seems to be a skill that's missing in um in this country anyway. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and it's so sad how people they just um, they, yeah they just accept these narratives without questioning, um, and especially the yeah. ones that, that do significant damage uh, to other people. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, yeah. like like you know, um, generally accepted perspectives about Muslims or you know gays or blacks or Mexicans mm -hmm. or whatever, and, mm -hmm. it, and w in which a simple conversation with some of these individuals. <laughs> would quickly rectify <laughs> right but i don't need that because i heard it on fox news so <laughs> i've got my truth thank you very much right 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 so uh so yeah but um but yeah i don't want to i don't want to keep you any longer so please uh let people know where they can find your work if they want to follow you yeah um so right now um www.bretigne.com b-r-e-t-i-g-n-e -E. um i don't post all the time i i um I'm working on bigger projects and, and kids too. So, you know, I don't do this all the time, but that's, that's where my stuff is. I'm also on Liberty.me. Um, you can, if you're not a member of Liberty.me, you can join and find me there. Twitter, um, at Brittany, B-R-E-T-I-G-N-E. This is up on Amazon. Um, I'm hoping to get an open bazaar to set up an open bazaar shop at some point soon. Um, and I'll be selling stuff there, but, um, I think they're still in beta and, I'm not really ready to set that up anyway. So, yeah, Facebook, Twitter, um, my blog are probably the best the best places. And Liberty.me. There's actually a whole collection of my articles um, on my on my page on Liberty.me. Cool. Yes, please check out her stuff. Uh, really, really awesome uh, content. You know, we need we need more content creators. I think in the Liberty um, in the Liberty genre. You know, as as we uh, you know, I, I I interview like rappers and authors and writers and podcasters and you know YouTubers and <laughs> I think there's it's just awesome when I see all these people spreading the message in different platforms. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff out there now. There's there's so much more than you know even like 10, 20 years ago. There's there's a lot of good stuff coming out. Yeah, yeah, it makes me really happy. So yeah, so um, so if anybody wants to help me out, you can do so through Bitcoin, um, PayPal or Patreon. The links are below. That's Patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out a uh, dollar show is all i ask um if you see value or in this in this content please feel free to donate right value for value is what capitalism is about right <laughs> voting with your dollars the only democracy i support um you know if you see something beautiful in the world you donate or you patronize it and that's how you uh that's how you propagate beauty <laughs> that's, the, that's the free market capitalist way right um but but awesome conversation uh Brittany, thank you very much for coming on the show thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. No problem. Uh, so this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and thus he's of liberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.